Bien, euh, j'ai le grand plaisir de vous présenter euh, Cecilia Poletto, professeure à l'université euh, Goethe euh, de Francfort et à l'université de Padoue. Euh, Cecilia est l'un des personnages clés de ce renouveau euh, d'intérêt pour les dialectes euh, basé sur l'utilisation en dialectologie. Euh, des, des outils de la théorie syntaxique, donc de la syntaxe paramétrique, de la cartographie euh, aussi. Euh, son livre euh, sur, justement, je faisais référence à ça, sur le sujet critique dans les dialectes italiens du Nord, de, publié en 2000 par Oxford University Press, a été un modèle pour des générations de jeunes dialectologues qui ont trouvé là un modèle méthodologique, empirique, extraordinaire pour le travail descriptif et explicatif qui est propre de la dialectologie moderne. Son travail aussi sur la diachronie de l'ordre de mots dans les langues romanes, qui concerne aussi en partie la question qui a été évoquée sur l'ordre de mots en diachronie, a aussi eu une grande influence. Donc, euh, bienvenue à Paris et merci d'être avec nous pour ce séminaire. Merci. merci beaucoup. Je vais parler en anglais parce que j'ai toutes mes notes en anglais et j'ai toujours des interférences aussi avec l'allemand. Alors, ça va être un peu compliqué. Mais vous pouvez poser des questions en français. Je vais essayer de répondre. Uh, OK, so what I would like to do today is... Uh, uh, I would like to, to show you how dialectology and dialectological data can be interesting. Uh, well, they have often been considered traditionally as an independent domain of investigation with different aims uh, uh, with respect to regular data. The reason for the fact that dialectology has been often seen as a, an independent type of, uh, uh, an independent domain has to do with the type of data we have to do with. Because generally, uh, you know, if you are at least nowadays, if you're talking to people who speak a dialect, they're very often bilingual uh, with the standard variety. So you get a lot of interference and you have to use the special methodologies to clean out the data from the interference from the standard. And I'm also going to consider a couple of things on this today. You know, there is also a very high rate of macro variation. So, uh, you know, what you can do with typology with different languages, uh, People say you cannot do with dialects. But I think that dialects can give you a sort of magnifying lens that shows you things that you could not see with typology. So, you know, dialectological data are, in a sense, the counterpart of typological data. Uh, so, as I was saying, there will be uh, something also on uh, controlled elicitation techniques that could be used for multilingual speakers uh, when you're studying multilingualism and language contact as well that can be taken from dialectological uh, work. Well, the dialectological investigation has always posed problems for linguistic research. You know, since the 19th century, when Banker uh, sent around his questionnaire on the German dialects so that the various priests in the various parishes felt it, uh, filled uh, in the, this questionnaire, he notices uh, that uh, the phonetic laws that should have applied without exceptions, at least uh, that you, you know, was the, the idea that phonetic laws apply without exception, at least in the 19th century in the new grammarian school. Well, he showed that, that actually the central German area, some uh, words were subject to the second, uh, um, phonet uh, second uh, sound shift, so the second Lautwerschiebung as they call it, while some other words were not. And so, you know, uh, this was a very fundamental problem at that time because it meant, uh, well, are there any unexceptional rules, rules without exception in the language? Well, actually, the Northern Italian dialects, more or less at the same period, put into question another idea, namely that, you know, uh, there was a leading or a retromance a unitary group which included the Friulian, it included the central uh, Dolomite area, and then uh, Retoromant in, uh, in Switzerland. 
because actually all the Northern Italian dialects here and there show exactly the same phenomena. Uh, so it was impossible to say that in this Retromance area that was more similar to French, uh, there was another population that was different with the others, you know, with respect to the others. So it seems that dialectological data have been posing questions in a quite fundamental way. On the other hand, I think that, you know, dialects can also be more interesting for various reasons. Uh, they are linguistic systems that are all in all similar to standard languages, with the only difference is that they have not been tampered with from an academia that tells you what you have to say. So, uh, they, they have not been coerced into a normative straitjacket. They are completely spontaneous languages, and in this sense they reveal more about the architecture of the language than standard languages that have been tempered with, as I said, by the academia, can reveal. Furthermore, they provide us with the possibility to trace linguistic development in real time. Uh, why? Well, because there are some dialects that are more conservative, crucially those in the countryside. There are dialects that are more advanced, crucially those in the cities, you know, in the centers of cultural development. And so instead of going back, uh, you know, to, to the, with the same language, with a lot of text, what you can do is you just move from one dialect to the other, and in that case, you can notice how languages develop. You know, this is a, an idea that De Saussure already had, that the, the diachronic axis was uh, similar to the geographic uh, change, and you can see that actually in dialects. So today, what I'm going to show you is that the geographical component it can in itself be used to guide our linguistic investigation and observing just the distributional patterns will show us something special. Uh, last thing I want to mention before we, we delve into the, the real problem is that we talk about a lot about big data, you know, nowadays. Uh, well, actually, big data have already been there in the dialectological tradition because when you are looking at, uh, at 300, 500, 1,000 different dialects, that's a kind of, uh, you know, big data before their time. Okay? So it's not, you know, billions, but it's at least in the thousands. So comparing the aerial distribution of phenomena helps us to identify which grammatical properties go together. And that's, you know, the same thing that Professor Ritzi was referring to when he said, uh, we can go back up to a certain time, and now there are new ways, uh, notably the one that uh, Giuseppe Longobardi has been adopting, to reconstruct languages in terms of types of parameters and connections to parameters. You can see them also here in dialect. So the power, firepower of linguistic maps is what I'm going to show you today. Uh, I will try to make three points, and I will show you on the basis of three phenomena uh, how uh, in our investigation can be guided simply by the geographical distribution. Uh, of, of the phenomenon. So the first type of uh, um, linguistic map I'm going to show you is the overlap, when two phenomena completely overlap. Uh, and uh, this will be done by means of negation and imperatives. Uh, the second type of uh, map is uh, of relation is the one of inclusion, when one phenomenon is geographically included into the other, so in a subset of languages uh, 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 of the whole, and I'm going to show you this uh, interrogative pronouns uh, followed by the complementizer, okay? And the third type of, uh, of distribution that I'm going to um, uh, talk about is the so-called layer for spots. What is layer for spots? This is a, a traditional term from dialectologists. When you see that the same phenomenon within an area is occurring here and there, but it's not uniform, okay? So that's why, you know, it recalls the, the spots of the leopard. And I'm going to talk about pseudo-partitives. As you can see, the three phenomena that I have selected might be of interest to French speakers, because they are similar also in French, or they occur also in French, or in, at least in French dialect. So let's start with the first case. Uh, well, there is one very famous generalization made by Raffaella Zanottini. She notices uh, that uh, in, uh, you know, in the dialects <coughs> that have a postverbal negative marker of the type of mia, 
of the type of pa, if you want, in French, uh, the imperative form is okay. But if you have a preverbal negative marker, so of the type non, of the type ne in French, what happens is that it's impossible to combine a true morphologically unique imperative form with the negative marker. So you cannot say something like non mangialo, so using manja, which is the, you know, the clear form for the imperative, but you have to change the form of the verb using an infinitable form. So across romance, languages that have this phenomenon, the type of verbal form that is selected can be different. So for instance, Spanish selects a subjunctive, a Southern Italian dialect selects a gerund, uh, you know, but in any case, there seems to be an incompatibility between a special type, so the preverbal type of negative marker, and, um, and the imperative form. Okay, so Zanottini's generalization says when we have a true imperative form, by true I mean un morphologically unambiguous, uh, so uh, the preverbal negative marker is not compatible with this form. Okay? Now, if you look at the exceptions, so if you look at Northern it Italy, there are very few exceptions to this. There are, however, two types of areas that po cause us problems. The first type of area is uh, the Emilian area, and I'm not going to talk about this because I already have in, a, in an old paper. What I'm going to concentrate on today is this, is the area, uh, Cortina d'Ampezzo is up in the mountains in the Veneto region. It's a very famous uh, resort, so it's nice to go and have some uh, field work there. But apart from this, it is problematic because it has exactly the exception that is not foreseen by the generalization. Namely, what you have is a preverbal negative marker followed by a true imperative form. You know, when you see that there are two phenomena that overlap, namely, preverbal negation overlap with this change in the um, imperative into infinitable or some other form, and you find just one exception, what do you do? Do you just throw away your generalization? Do you throw away the exception? Or what do you do? Okay. So the solution to the puzzle is the following. If you look at other retromance dialects, you see that it, they have a, a system which is rather similar to French. So they have a preverbal and a postverbal negative marker. So they have a ne form and they have nia, which is also the word for nothing. Okay. So similar to rien in French. Uh, and what you see is that again. This form with this double uh, negation here is not compatible with the true imperative form. What happens is here that it is the negative marker that is changed. Okay? So how is it changed? It's changed into no. So this no here is not the usual preverbal negation or postverbal negation. It is the form, a strong form, which means no in English or in French or in Italian, okay? So this means that, once again, if we go back, you know, a case like this here is only, apparently, the usual regular type of preverbal negative marker. It does not correspond to that type of negative marker. What it does is it's actually the pro-sentence negation. So the negation that means, uh, you know, the negation of the whole sentence, no. Okay, just like in English. Okay, so which brings us to the conclusion that the relation between imperative and negation does not only depend on the position of the negative marker. It's not that all preverbal negative markers are excluded. It's only one special type of preverbal negative marker that is excluded and that is incompatible with a true imperative form. And uh, <clears throat> a strong but preverbal negative marker is perfectly okay. It's just a clitic one that doesn't work. Okay? And this brings us to another conclusion, namely the fact that, so we thought generally that negation was incompatible, so you change the verbal form. Actually, this dialect show you that you can also have the opposite. In the incompatibility between a certain type of negative marker and the imperative form. You can either solve this tension by changing the verbal form, or you can solve the tension changing the negative marker, which is actually what you find in a lot of other languages in the world where imperative forms 
have a special type of negation. So modality forms have a special type of negation. So looking at an overlap case and at its exception, what we get is a much more clear case of, uh, uh, so we understand better what it means uh, to change an imperative into an infinitable form and why probably these two, so preverbal ne negative markers and true imperative forms are incompatible between each other. It's actually just an effect of a very well-known fact that so-called prohibitives in, all the langu in many languages of the world are special. Okay? So negative imperatives in the, terms of, in the sense of prohibitives are special, probably for semantic reasons. Okay, so the second case that I'm going to talk about is the phenomenon of inclusion. And here I'm going to show you also some maps. Okay, so the pattern of inclusion is actually a pattern that has a lot of, had a lot of, of, for, of luck in, in uh, linguistic uh, history. You know, it has to do with the fact that you can build implicational relations. So if you can say if A, then B. And in our case, so what I'm going to, to try to show is that if a dialect has a structure with a WH item, so with an inter interrogative pronoun plus the complementizer, in main clauses, then it must have it in embedded clauses. Okay? So, and this is a typical pattern of inclusion that shows you probably where the structure starts out and how it is then developed and how it expands, probably also through history, not only through a geographical domain. Okay? Uh, so this type of implicational relations, if A then B, have been very famous since Greenberg's thesis uh, that was the founding moment of, of typology. You know, typologists generally use exactly this type of configurations to show when two phenomena correlate, okay? So, comparing the area distribution of a single phenomenon helps us to identify implicational scales and it helps us to identify the extension patterns that hold for historical geographical variation. Hence, implicational scales and the phenomenon of inclusion are a very powerful instrument to, to define variation and understand uh, uh, how data work, okay? So, just an example. You see here a dialect. This is actually a Veneto dialect. What you see here is that I do not know who left is translated as I do not know who that left, okay? So you have a complementizer doubling the WH item. Actually, this is, was also found in some French dialect, uh, and it's also found in the history of, of English. In more or less in Shakespeare's period, you find cases like this. And it's actually what is known as a violation of the W field filter. It should not exist. Okay, so the phenomenon is found throughout all interrogative elements in the central Veneto area. This is already the final stage. It's not all that interesting. Uh, so it's obligatory with all WH elements in all embedded questions. However, if we move to a more uh, conservative area like Trentino, what we see is that we can already see how this phenomenon has developed. So historically, so we go back in time, so to speak. And actually what you find is that <clears throat> here, uh, you see that it is possible, actually the phenomenon is obligatory, so you have what doubled by that, but this is not possible in main clauses, okay? Uh, so WHK occurs primarily in indirect interrogatives. So, and here is a map. What you see here is that the blue triangles uh, uh, signal varieties uh, that have WH plus the complementizer only in indirect questions. You might uh, ask why the rest of the area is empty. That's because the phenomenon is not there. It's not, you know, in Lombardy is uh, relatively not, uh, not very well represented, although there are varieties that have that. Okay, so what you see is that in all, so most of the dialects have it only in embedded clauses. There are dialects that have it also <coughs> in, uh, in uh, direct questions, and these are the red triangles, and you see here that there are, you know, this has been extended in a lot of dialects. There is one exception. This exception 
is the case in which the WH plus the complementizer is only found in uh, main interrogatives. And now one asks why. You know, when you see a number of dialects that start out with the type of structure WH plus that in embedded, some other extended to main clauses, why is there just one case in which it doesn't work? So let's go and look at cases like this and see what happens. Actually, so the first empirical generalization that we have is if WH plus complementizers occurs in main interrogatives, then it also occurs in embedded interrogatives. And what about, you know, oh uh, well, the only exception so our case here. Uh, well, I'm going to show you that the reason for that exception has to do with the type of WH, okay? And this goes very well with what Professor Rizzi had just been talking about. He said that, you know, subjects are special and extraction of a subject implies that you have to do something more than extracting an object uh, in the complementizer system. Well, actually what you see is that in main interrogatives, the first WH element that occurs with the complementizer is the subject. Is the one corresponding to the subject. So, you know, here you have an example of, of Barchis, right? And you see uh, that the, the who corresponding to the subject has the complementizer, while the who corresponding to the object doesn't have the complementizer, okay? So the only exception that we found actually reveals that subjects are special. And if you think of English, actually it's the same thing in English, because in English, do support in many interrogatives is not used precisely only with the subject. So the cases that we have seen are an exception to our implicational relation, actually reveal something special, namely that uh, subjects are special, not only in extraction cases, but not only in embedded interrogatives, even in main interrogatives, they can have a different behavior. I could show you also other dialects that have special patterns only for the subject for other structures, but I just wanted to concentrate on, on inclusion uh, on today. Okay, now let's concentrate on embedded interrogatives now and see what happens. Uh, the third empirical generalization that I'm going to propose to you is that, that has been found, is that if a WH plus complementizer does not occur with all WH items, how does it distribute then? Well, it occurs first with those that are also possible in free relative clauses. So the point I'm going to show you now is that there is a link between the creation of the structure WH plus complementizer with the fact that these are precisely the items that occur in free relative clauses, and since you're French, you might have thought of ce que in embedded interrogatives, which are, you know, a ce que structure is actually a free relative clause. Okay, okay so there are three factors. Uh, if, you, if you concentrate on the Trentino area, which is, as I said, the one where you can see uh, how the development uh, has, uh, has gone. Uh, so the occurrence of the complementizer depends on three factors. First, the type of WH item, so the WH words we are considering. Second, the pre- or post-verbal position of the subject. So even if this is not the subject, the subject is always there, you know, causing problems. And as I said, the embedded versus main status of the clause, which is what we have seen up to now. Okay? So uh, this is Trentino, and you see that Quando che, so when that, is used when the subject is postverbal. Okay? The sentence means, uh, I wonder uh, when all the workers will come. And here you see, when that will come, they will come, all the workers. And this is the doubling uh, clitic we were talking about earlier. Okay, uh, if you have a pre-verbal subject like all the work, you see that there is no complementizer here. So the position, so the, the realization of the complementizer depends on the position of the subject. At the moment, uh, I have only half a hint of how to explain this, but it's interesting that the, you know, something again in the CP layer is combining with uh, 
a, a special position of the subject. Okay. Uh, now, uh, second point, uh, in the dialect of Trento, we are once again in Trentino, you see that the WH element meaning where can occur, so in DO, can occur with a complementizer, the WH element meaning cosa, so what, uh, cannot occur with a complementizer. Okay? So it really depends on the WH word for some dialects. Hmm? So if you have an idea of how the distribution of WH plus K goes, and these are the Chambra, Sole, and Valdinon are three valleys in Trentino, and you see that, you know, if you consider all the cases, you don't see much. The red part means uh, the cases where you have uh, WH plus, plus K, while the blue part uh, means uh, those that go without K. And you know, you just see 40, 25, uh, 40 percentages. So the percentages don't take us very far until we go to a, a more detailed uh, fact. And actually, I, I'm not going to present you with all the data because this would take too long, but there are um, implicational relations uh, that have been observed. So uh, let's go through them. When in a dialect, uh, oh, uh, the, there is a, you know, a doubling with when, so when you have it with when, you have it with who. And when you have it with who, you also have it with where. Which means that, you know, in a, in few, find that in a certain dialect, when has the complementizer doubling it, then you are sure that who and where also have it, but not the other way around. Okay, so the implicational scale goes only into one, in one direction. Same here with how many, and how many followed by a noun. So if you have it with how many, you not, don't necessarily have it with uh, how many x, but the other way is true. So when you find it in how many x, then you have it with how many. And if you have it with y, you also have it with, well, uh, with how. The reason cannot be delinking, because you know, uh, there are cases like how many is, and how many x is not, not delinked, none of the two. It cannot be the distinction between a WH word and a WH phrase, if you think that could be, because you know, in the first example, you just have only WH words. Uh, it cannot be the argumental adjunct distinction. So uh, it, I think that it must have to do with the internal structure of WH items themselves. And I'm going to show you precisely this. So, uh, even in French, what has uh, various realizations. So you can use que, you can use quoi, and you use ce que in embedded interrogatives. What you see in these dialects is a similar effect. So you can use quel, which means uh, uh, cela, so which means uh, that one. You can use cosa, which means uh, thing, literally. And you can use que, which etymologically is a pure WH root. Okay, so from Indo-European uh, uh, Lavio Velar. Okay, interestingly, you see that, uh, this is just what I was saying, so it's, uh, it's similar to French, ce que. What you see is the following, namely that those dialects that use the distal pronoun, so they use quel or quel meaning that one, they have the doubling of the complementizer. Okay, so you see three different dialects, uh, you see Segonzano, San Bernardo, Class. These are all dialects in the Trentino area, so the far northeast of Italy. So what you see in all these cases, what you get is uh, something similar to ce que in French. Okay? But, uh, so, it seems that the fact that uh, elements are like the demonstrative and then they, they obligatorily have the complementizer, might actually prove that these embedded interrogatives are actually light-headed relative clauses. They look like relatives, just like in French. Okay? So, uh, so once again, let's go back here. So among the real possible realization of what, what we see is that the one that at most presents the complementizer in numeric terms, so in, in various dialects, is the one that corresponds to the distal pronoun demonstrative, so just like in French, ce que. 
You also find cases of causas. There are some dialects that have causa k. You find very few cases of k, uh, which does not necessarily mean that you know, we have to exclude kk because it's a repetition. Uh, language doesn't work in this way. There are a lot of examples like cc. Uh, where you can repeat the same word. You know, in German you find a lot of cases of DD uh, uh, with the relative pronoun and the article and nothing happens, right? So it cannot, it cannot simply be excluded by saying, well, uh, we don't want to repeat the same word twice. You know, it's, that's not an explanation. Okay, so, uh, so let's see whether this idea that actually these embedded structures, in, the embedded interrogatives are actually uh, master free relative clauses, or better, lightheaded relative clauses, what it can explain. So it can explain why the phenomenon starts out in embedded clauses. Relatives are embedded clauses only. Why postverbal subjects are preferred? Because at least in this dialect, uh, relative clauses tend to have a postverbal subject. This is actually also found in Italian. In Italian, it's very often the case that the subject is postverbal in interrogative clause. I think that even in French, you can get the possibility to have a postverbal subject in, a, in an interrogative clause. Maybe that's a bit literary, but uh, I was told that's also possible. And it can also explain the fact that they start out with those WH items uh, that in can introduce free relative clauses, you know, because that's obvious. If it is a relative clause, the first point in which you change the structure is the one of a free relative. What it does not explain is why it only occurs with some WH elements, uh, some forms of the interrogative pronoun and not other. So, but as I said, what you find is that the KK is not possible. Cosa K is possible in few di in some dialects, but then Kel K is the most widespread one. Uh, so uh, the pure WH item is the least frequent one. Well, at this point, one might think that you know Italian expresses at least the standard Italian expresses the element what with K cosa. So you see it's a complex element made up of uh, the form for que and the cause which means thing, the form that means thing. So this suggests maybe that cosa que could be derived, uh, you know, uh, by movement of, you know, you start ha and have que cosa and then you move cosa. And this is actually a reversal in the internal structure of the WH element. So it's not a case of violation of the so-called WT computer because that K is not even the complementizer, it's something else. Uh, so this idea that actually this is something that has to do with the doubling of the WH element is also supported <laughs> by data like this one where you see twice who. So you can say this, this sentence means I do not know uh, who who will uh, clean down the dishes, will clean the dishes, okay? Uh, so it seems that it is possible to think that this WH plus complementizer is actually not a WH plus a complementizer. It's actually a complex WH item, you know, which has movements inside, so K cosa or cosa K, depending on, on the type you take. So it might be the case that embedded interrogatives are actually masterfully relative clauses uh, with a double-headed analysis a la cinque, which I'm not going to talk about today because that would take us too far. We'd have to introduce all these analyses and it would take too long. So uh, I I've covered the case of uh, um, overlap. I've covered the case in which two phenomena have an inclusion pattern, the one of WH plus the complementizer. And now I'm going to show you the, the very famous leper spots. So the type of uh, geographical distribution that is uh, very often found in dialects or in very closely related languages of the same area, okay? Okay, so uh, I, I probably don't have to introduce this uh, to uh, a French audience, but it's known that within the Romance languages, uh, you either have bare nouns, like in Spanish, or you have so-called pseudo-partitives, uh, uh, just like in French, when you want to express an indefinite, okay? 
so uh, the same is true for uncountable singular nouns and for plurals. Okay. These are called the pseudo partitives because actually the interpretation is not that of a, a real partitive. It's not that there is a given quantity and you take some of a given quantity. What you do is just you're just saying an indefinite, I eat some bread or I eat some cherries, nothing more. Okay. Well, interestingly, Italian has both. It has both bare nouns and partitives and one wonders what this optionality is. You know that in a formal framework of syntax, uh, optionality is never a good thing. We always want to have a clear rule. So let's try to see whether this optionality is rather some kind of division of labor. So that, you know, the uh, um, pseudo partitive is doing uh, one job and the beer noun is doing another job. Let's see whether this is possible, okay? So the question becomes whether Italian uh, uh, pseudo-partitives and verb nouns uh, overlap or whether they are split according to the, you know, some property that we still have to discover. Maybe semantic property or syntactic property, we don't know yet. Well, if you look at, this is a, a, a picture taken from the IES. The IES is the Atlas uh, Italians of the Südschweiz, which is, uh, mm, well, by now, at least one century old, and it shows you the following, uh, uh, the following distribution across uh, northern Italian dialects. So there is a possibility to have, uh, uh, in some dialects, to have the preposition di, de plus the definite article, so the same effect that you find in French. There is the possibility to find bare nouns, what you find in Spanish. There is the possibility to find a definite article, and then there is the possibility to find the bare preposition, which actually in French you find only negative clauses. Okay. Uh, so, uh, interestingly, the Northern Italian dialect, uh, here I give you uh, the dialect of uh, Sondalo in Sondrio, so this is Northern Lombardy. Uh, what you find is also that here there is just a bare preposition when there is a negative marker, just like in French. Okay, so this is the French pattern essentially for this dialect. So what I'm going to, to introduce to you now is I'm going to show you the dialects that have a French patterns, the dialect that have a Spanish pattern, the dialects that have a, a mixed pattern, and we will concentrate on those to see how this variation goes, you know, to solve the puzzle of why Italian is a, apparently has optionality. By the way, if you talk to Italian speakers, uh, uh, speakers from northern Italy, but even between Lombardy and Veneto or Piedmont, uh, there is a lot of variation in the way people use uh, either the bare noun or the pseudo partitive. Okay. Okay. So the research questions of this part is: What is the distribution of bare nouns and uh, pseudo partitives, uh, bare d and definites in the northern Italian dialects? What do we find four forms? Do they compete for the same semantic field of indefiniteness, even definite articles? You know, these facts, these constructions also in French have drawn so much attention precisely for this reason, because you have a definite article that is marking an indefinite. So it seems like a contradiction essentially, okay? So how can we model this vari the variation that we find and what is the grammatical source of this variation? Okay, uh, here I'm using our database, the ASIT database, it's online. It's uh, the syntactic atlas uh, of, uh, of Italy. It has primarily data from Northern Italy, but now we also have quite a lot of data from Central and Southern Italy. And what you see here is the following. You see the so-called leopard spots. Uh, this is just meant to show you what leopard spots mean, okay? So, uh, all these data are taken from a translation, which means that you give the people a sentence in standard Italian and you ask them to translate into their own dialect, which means that there is a priming effect, okay? The priming effect, however, can be controlled if you just split, you know, if you give them both possibilities, because Italian has the, you know, 
uh, both possibilities. It has bare nouns and it has uh, pseudopartitives. And you can separate the data that you get concerning, you know, if in the input there was a bare noun or if the input sentence in the standard there is a, um, a pseudopartitive. So, uh, if you start with definite articles from an input of bare nouns, so, you know, the people got something like, I eat meat, and how do they translate it? So what you see is that most of them, so these are the black dots, use a definite article. So they answer in the dialect with, I eat the meat, okay? If you start from an input from a definite article, you see then essentially most of them use a definite article. So it seems that the definite article is something special. Okay, so what happens here? Uh, here I'm considering uh, three types of dialects, Emilian dialects, Friulian dialects, and Ligurian dialects, okay? So what you see here is that essentially, uh, I'm going to spoil the whole story, Emilian functions like French. So it has only pseudopartitives, it doesn't have bare nouns, so it's impossible to say, I eat meat. You know, I, they always say, I eat of the meat, nothing more. Uh, Friulian just works like Spanish. In Friulian, they say, I eat meat, but if you give them in Italian the input, I eat of the meat, which is, you see, the uh, PA input here, what happens is that they always translated with a bear uh, noun, and they get a bit of definite article as well. In Ligurian, the situation is more complicated because Ligurian, and we are going to talk about that a bit more, Ligurian is a dialect that is uh, uh, split between French and, and Spanish, so it's similar to the standard Italian situation, okay? So, if you have an input as a bare noun or as a, a pseudopartitive, there are some cases of definite articles that crop up, okay? Uh, so, the proposal that uh, I have been making, making with uh, uh, Francesco Pinzin, who is an assistant of mine in a project at the University of Frankfurt, and we are grateful to the DFK for financing this project, um, is that essentially definite articles uh, here in this context have a generic or weak interpretation. You know, they are so-called weak definites. They give you classes. They don't give you a specific element, okay? Uh, so, uh, you say, when you say something like, my sister buys oranges every day, or if you say, my sister buys the oranges every day, that the oranges is just, you know, a class. It means uh, that type of fruit and nothing more. So these are weak definites, okay? And they are a bit different uh, with respect to the pseudo-partitive construction, okay? So, the case of definite articles used when the input has an indefinite bare nouns are actually weak definite. So people just translate I eat meat with I ate the meat because they use it as generic. Okay? Uh, so what I did, what we did, is we excluded them from our analysis of the variation in the realization of indefinite. So all the cases where people said I eat the meat we leave them out because they are not, they are weak definite, so they are not telling anything about the distribution of bare nouns or partitives, okay? Do they compete for the same semantic field of indefinite? No, because, you know, uh, they, there is a lack of interdependence between the possible realization of indefinite and the availability of distribution of, uh, of these uh, generics, okay? And here I've quoted a bit of literature on, uh, on the semantics of this. Now, Let's look at the distribution. So I have filtered out all the cases in which definites were occurring because they are not relevant to our investigation. And what we find here is that look at the distribution of bare nouns and, uh, and pseudopartitives and of the bare the, so the bare preposition. So interestingly, you know, when you have a bare noun in the input, some people answer with a bare noun in the output. Okay, uh, so light yellow means uh, 
all of the cases, all of the examples we provided the people with were answered with their noun in the dialect. Uh, the uh, orange dots means some, and the black dots means none. So what you see here is that the bare noun area is this one, okay? You see, it's in the northeast, okay? Uh, now, uh, if you look at, uh, if you provide an input with a, a partitive ar article, people, some of the people here still answer with a bare noun, okay? Some other don't, why? Because they have interference from the standard. Okay? So they try to place the, the uh, partitive also in the dialect, but some others don't. Okay? Uh, so essentially, the beer nouns area is concentrated in the northeast. Okay? This part is Friulia. Okay? If you look at, let me see, okay, now, if you start with the distribution of their nouns of partitives and verde, uh, and you try to have the input in their noun with the partitive output, what you see is that the partitives are concentrated in this area, which takes Emilia and Liguria. Okay, this is the area that works like French, right? And here again, even if you give a bare noun in the input, they still answer with the partitive in the output, because in their dialects, there is no other way. So they don't have their nouns at all, okay? So they are just like French. They are reacting as French speakers. If you give a French speaker, um, I don't know, a sentence in English to translate into French, they will put the, the, the partitive there, okay? Okay, this is the distribution of the bear de. So the preposition without the article, which exists, I mean, it exists also in French, uh, only for negative uh, sentences. In a lot of dialects, it exists uh, also, especially in Provencal dialect, it exists also for positive sentences. But again, what you see is that the pierre de is concentrated here in Liguria, okay? And here is the Provencal area, you see? And there is something up in the north also in Lombardy, okay? So, what happens now? Let's cons consider only Emilian. Uh, in the first column, you find the partitive in the input. So the Italian sentence had a partitive. They only answer with partitives, you see, with a small amount of definites. And we said the definites we leave aside. But you see that these dialects only have the partitive. What is interesting is that if you give them a bare noun input, well, the bare noun input is still translated mostly with uh, a partitive, with a definite, and very small, uh, a very small amount is produced with bare nouns only by young and interfered speakers, okay? Now, let's look at Friulian. Well, in the bare noun input, Friulian speakers don't have any hesitation, they just answer with only with their nouns. What happens if you give them a, a partitive? Well, part of them answer with a bare noun. The younger speakers interfered with Italian provide you with a PA. What is interesting here is the other column. The other column is actually that they try to translate the partitive with un poc, so a bit. So, Evidently, these speakers are bilingual speakers, so they know what this means in Italian. And what they, they want to tell you is that I've heard that there is a difference. I cannot pronounce it really in my dialect because I don't have partitives, so I add a quantifier. Okay? And we started from this intuition to solve the puzzle of why uh, Italian has the two forms. Now, Ligurian is a bit more complicated. Maybe I can just... Uh, 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 skip it because I see that it's, uh, we are already at, at the end. Only what I wanted to show you is that the Berdo in Ligurian is only found in negative sentences. This is not surprising to you because you're French, <laughs> okay? But uh, let's look at, uh, at what is happening here. So Emilian, when it has a bare noun in the input, it answers with a partitive. When it has a partitive in the input, it answers with a partitive, so it's like French. Friulian, 
is like Spanish, where input in, uh, with a where noun uh, gives you a where noun in the output, partitive in the input, it gives you a where noun in the output plus a lexical quantifier. There is one type of Ligurian that looks like French. This is not dramatic because, you know, it's the area which is uh, uh, close to France. But there is also another type of Ligurian that works like Italian. So if you have a ver noun in the input, it gives you a ver noun in the output. If you have a partitive in the input, it gives you a partitive in the output. So it, just, it is just matching Italian. Okay? Now, starting from this observation that Triulian speakers uh, use a quantity marker, so a quantifier, when they translated the partitive, the Italian partitive, we have found that actually, even in Italian, it's uh, uh, the distribution of uh, the partitive is, so with long-term habitual activities, uh, the partitive is never found. With the specification quantificational context, uh, the partitive is there. So actually, in Italian, there is a division of labor between uh, specific quantities and, uh, and mm, long habitual terms, uh, activities, which might also be historically the way French part pseudo partitives have developed. Okay? So essentially, the beer noun covers uh, when there is no quantity, no specific quantity, and partitives uh, cover when there is uh, a specific quantity, okay? So you use uh, partitives in Italian and in Ligurian only when there is a specific quantity, which is not saying uh, that the element that you are considering is specific in itself. There is, it's the quantity that is defined, okay? Not the element in itself. And otherwise, it uses bare nouns, okay? Uh, what it, this means is that Emilian, just like French, has extended through history the pseudo-partitives also to uh, cases in which there is absence of quantity and that Friulian hasn't done it yet. Okay? So essentially, if we model the variation, we have languages like French where a specific quantity or no specific quantity doesn't make any, any difference. They are just all pseudo-partitives. You have dialects where like, like Italian, where bare nouns are used in non-specific quantities and partitives in specific quantities, and you have dialects where everything is covered by bare nouns. Okay? So what is the hypothesis? Just coming to uh, an end, we think that the distribution of bare nouns and uh, pseudo-partitives is related to the morphology of gender and number okay? in these languages, which means no number morphology no bear nouns. So bear nouns are only allowed in those dialects that have a morphology. This has already been proposed in the literature by Elizabeth Stark, who actually worked with us in the project, but with an interesting twist. So, you know, in a language like Italian, plural is found, uh, plural markers and gender markers are found both for masculine and feminine. Uh, and we take here, we consider here only regular markings. Uh, so not, not the specific markings uh, so of, of uh, two or three nouns, okay? Uh, what happens here is that you see that the plural marking of an N in Emilia, West Lombardy and, uh, and Piedmont, you see that the areas where you find uh, um, lack of plural marking is exactly the same area where you find the partitives. See, so it's easy. You know, on the one hand, if you say, okay, I make the hypothesis that French has uh, developed pseudo-partitives because it, it is, uh, is losing uh, number morphology and Spanish has number morphology. You are making your generalization based on two, two languages. Here, you're doing it on the basis of 300. So it has a, an entirely different empirical validity. Uh, okay, so. Okay, so just to sum up, absence of number marking on the noun means absence of bare nouns. So the relation needs to hold at least for one gender. Up to now, we have found that the relation holds for masculine. So it doesn't matter if feminine has, uh, still has a number marking. When you lose number marking on the masculine, you start producing, you, you start losing bare nouns. Okay. 
so summing up, the distribution of weak definites uh, is tangential to the competition between bare nouns and partitives. The distribution of bare nouns and partitives in the languages that have both is not randomic. When there is a quantity of reading, you use partitives. When there is no quantity of reading, you use bare nouns. And the link between noun morphology and the absence of bare nouns is related to absence of number morphology only in the masculine. OK, just to sum up, looking at map, maps pays off. It tells you quite a lot. It tells us to see correlations when patterns coincide, when they exclude themselves, when one phenomenon implies the others, or when variation is apparently randomic. The data distribution cannot make wonder, it's clear, but you still have to have a theory to interpret this variation, but at least it can guide uh, your idea and restrict the family of analysis that you can use. Thanks a lot. <laughs>